Well, welcome everyone. Buffett and Beyond Research is excited to bring you the complete science of the greatest stock selection method ever, and you're going to see why as we go along. And remember, if you want to live at the beach like Jimmy Buffett once did, you've got to learn how to invest even better than Warren Buffett does now. And folks, we can do that. Now, there's a supplement at the end of this, and it has to do with hedging your ETF or the best stocks in the ETF or the best stocks in any index. And folks, you want to stick around to see that because this type of hedging is easy. One, two, three, and you go away. Believe me. All right. How to outperform any index or ETF based on the clean surplus stock selection model. And folks, this method has been around, but nobody uses it because they never used it for stocks, except for one person named Warren Buffett. And everybody else tried to use it for either finance and accounting. But this is the link between accounting and investing. Now, for the past 20 years, the clean surplus stock selection model has shown that if you pick the above average performing stocks in any index, over time, the above average stocks will outperform the below average stocks. Yes, we are talking common sense. Now, in any one year, just 25% of professional money managers can outperform the S&P 500. However, in the following year, just one third of that 25% can do it two years in a row. And from Morningstar, June 2002, they showed that over any 10 year period, 96% of professional money managers, and those are the folks who run the publicly traded mutual funds because we can follow them, 96 of those folks out there who manage those mutual funds cannot outperform the averages on a risk-adjusted basis. Again, Morningstar, June 2002. And folks, it has been that way all along since then and before then. Now, the key is to use a stock selection model that allows you to identify these above-average stocks because we're using common sense here, but finding those stocks is a different story. Now, what about ETFs? Well, most ETFs are constructed to mimic an industry or an index. Thus, these ETFs contain both the above average performing stocks and the below average performing stocks in that industry or index. And we're looking for those above average performing stocks. In order to outperform an, an index such as the S&P 500 or any ETF, and boy, we're going to go into ETFs toward the end, we should buy the best performing above average stocks in that index or ETF and leave the below average stocks for somebody else to buy. And the very most important question then becomes how do we select the best performing stocks in that index or any index? The answer is the Buffett and Beyond stock selection method based on clean surplus. Now, clean surplus, again, is the link. And you have to remember this because accounting is different than finance, which is different than investing. And clean surplus is the link between accounting and investing. This following 20-minute presentation allows a brief look into the doctoral research over 20 years of practical portfolio implementation and risk analysis of the methodology. Now, the methodology is then applied, which will show you how to perform most ETFs almost all the time. And just introducing where this was brought to the attention of the investing public, Dr. Joseph Belmonte, Doctor of Business and Finance from Nova Southeastern University, MBA from Florida Atlantic University, and former Associate Professor of Finance at Northwood University. And Buffett and Beyond is also registered with the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy as a quality assurance service provider of continuing professional education credits. So folks, this method is not only based on a doctoral dissertation, two books written on it by Dr. Belmonte and also the state National Association of State Boards of Accountancy recognizes this as a real product. And the state of Florida allowed the course to be written and it's called the predictability of clean surplus accounting. And as you know, Professional accountant CPA needs so many credits every couple of years to stay registered. This is one of those courses that they take or could take. Now, let's look at the returns. And this is from December 2022. So we're looking at over 20 years of returns. 
and most of these returns are reviewed by accountants. So the portfolio, and they, we select 30 stocks a year, or 30 stocks a year are selected with the highest clean surplus return on equity. So our portfolios have returned 15.5% per year, S&P 9.4% per year, Berkshire Hathaway, and you know who owns that, Mr. Warren Buffett, 11.1% per year. Now when you compound those returns since 2002, the portfolio, our 30 stock growth portfolio has returned over a thousand percent, almost 1,200 percent, S&P 500, 404 percent, and Berkshire Hathaway, 626 percent. So Berkshire Hath outperforms the S&P 500 and our 30 stock growth portfolio, by the way, which is primarily buy and hold, so we're not trading here. This is not a trading system. Outperforms Buffett by almost two to one. And don't forget, Buffett recently has said that he will not, or Berkshire will not be able to outperform the S&P 500 going forward because they're just handling too much money. And he says that every year at his annual stockholders convention out there in Omaha, Nebraska. All right. We want to be able to outperform any index or industry or related ETF or industry related ETF. And out of that index or industry, we want to select stocks that are growing the fastest and the most consistently. Now remember, 96% of professional money managers cannot outperform the S&P over any 10 year period. Now we use a model that allows us to compare and thus select stocks that are growing the fastest and most consistently, mostly large cap stocks. We take our stocks out of the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. Now we want the companies that make the most efficient use of our invested dollars and these are the companies whose stocks will appreciate faster than the market averages and the associated ETFs. Now the model is called clean surplus analysis again the link between accounting and investing. And what is clean surplus? Well, it's a comparable method. It allows us to compare one company to another relative to their efficiency, predictability, and comparability. So this is the comparability model that has predictive powers. Now the income statement doesn't do it, and the balance sheet doesn't do it. And the accounting community was searching for a return on equity that is comparable. Now how do we know the accounting statements don't allow for efficiency, predictability, and comparability? Well, if they did, then all the accounting professors and all the finance professors and all the professionals who come from those disciplines should be able to outperform the market averages and guess what they can't do it folks now who teaches investment analysis in our fine university yeah the people from the accounting discipline and the finance discipline none of whom can outperform the averages they teach us numbers that are unique but not comparable to individual companies now accounting numbers were used for in control, uh, internal control they must account for everything and we demand this of the accounting system they were never meant to be used to compare one company with another they're used internally however these are the only numbers we have and analysts use them all the time and that's why they can't outperform the S&P 500. Now, let's look at investing. Let's look at Corporation A, Corporation B. Let's look at a finance and accounting. Now, remember, finance and accounting are used within the corporation. And the corporation wants to look at their finance numbers and accounting numbers over time. They call that time series analysis. So Corporation A wants to know if it's doing better or not better than last year. But Corporation A has different things going on, unique items going on that Corporation B doesn't have. So again, finance and accounting are used within the corporation to see how the corporation performs over time. But investing doesn't do that. Investing says, do I want Corporation A in my client's portfolio or do I want Corporation B in my client's portfolio? That's the difference between investing, finance, and accounting. Yes, accounting is different than finance. So if you remember one thing from this whole seminar, accounting is different than finance, which is different than investing. 
Now, what is clean surplus accounting? Clean surplus, you take traditional accounting earnings minus non-recurring items minus future li liabilities, such as the stock options that are given to the CEO and the CFO and all the people at the top of the business. Yeah, that equals net income. Now, the first time this was talked about that I know of, and I remember I did the research on all of this, was 1977, 1977, yes, in Warren Buffett's stockholder or annual stockholder meeting. And he mentioned two things in there, and one was you take the traditional accounting earnings minus non-recurring items and the future liabilities he was talking about with those stock options. So that equals net income. And then we must develop a different owner's equity or book value, and we'll show you why in a second. So here's that second. We're looking at the income statement. So you have money in, and then you take away all your expenses, and you get earnings. Now you take earnings and it goes over to the balance sheet and it gives you book value, which is synonymous with owner's equity. However, when you're using clean surplus from the traditional accounting earnings, you take away those non-recurring items because non-recurring items are unique to an individual company. They do not allow for predictability because it could be a one-time sale of property. It could be a one-time sale of a, a patent or the purchase of a patent. So from earnings, you take away non-recurring items and future liabilities and you get a net income. So you take Take net income and bring it over to the balance sheet. Well, folks, let's look at this. It doesn't make sense that earnings brought over to the book value or owner's equity is going to be the same as net income, which is brought over to the book value or owner's equity. So clean surplus uses this net income, as Buffett said in 1977, and then you bring it over to the book value or owner's equity. How do we know this? There are two items out there. One is a case study on Warren Buffett from a finance book, from Advanced Finance, and the other one is Buffettology, written by Buffett's former daughter-in-law. So there we have two sources that go back. Plus there's research, there's academic research, but the academic research talks about this in a finance circumstance or an accounting circumstance. Buffett brought it out and said, I want to use it to filter out stocks. We at Buffett and Beyond Research use it as a stock selection method. So, yeah, it may sound the same, but folks, it's very, very different. Okay, of course, that looked, that looked very confusing over there, but gee, we have a computer program that does all of this for you and for me. <laughs> so, let's look at IBM. Well, we're looking at the traditional accounting ROE. So right here in this slide, we are trying to show you that traditional accounting ROE is totally, totally, totally different than the clean surplus return on equity. So traditional accounting ROE for IBM, you look at these numbers way down here, 64%, 50 something percent, 30 something percent. Folks, if you could buy a stock that had a return on equity of 30 something percent, 40 percent, 50 percent, you would go out and buy, you'd mortgage your house, you would sell your dog and buy that stock. But let's take a look at clean surplus return on equity and we can see this clean surplus return on equity is much, much lower than tr traditional accounting return on equity. And you can see, we're looking down here at an average TV, uh, standard deviation. The standard deviation of the traditional accounting ROE was 14%. Standard deviation of the clean surplus ROE was 1%. So it's very, very consistent. And the average stock in the S&P 500, this was brought out by Warren Buffett in 1977. The average stock has about a 13 to 14 percent clean surplus return on equity. So that's our magic number. We want the benchmark of around 13 percent. If you select stocks that have a higher clean surplus ROE of 13 percent, it should outperform the average stock. If it's lower, it will underperform the stock. So we're looking at IBM with a way below average. Remember the average clean surplus ROE of the average stock is 13%. 
IBM is way, way lower than that. So about one third of it. Now, when you look at traditional accounting ROE, it says buy, buy, buy this stock. When you look at the clean surplus ROE, it says it's a dog. Keep your dog and do not buy this stock. So folks, let's go back 10 years and see how IBM has been doing relative to the S&P 500. S&P 500 is this black line up here. Yeah, we recognize this as 2002 right in here. And this yellow line or mustard colored line is IBM. So we're looking at IBM totally underperforming the S&P 500. It's down about 20% while the S&P is up about 160%. Big, big difference. And if you're using the traditional accounting ROE, you may be in this stock. Why? Because of this great big traditional accounting ROE, totally different from the clean surplus ROE. All right. How do we know that everybody uses the wrong ROE? Well, one reason is we just showed you. But let's go back to these statistics. In any one year, just 25% of professional money managers can outperform the S&P 500. In the second year, just one third of that 25%, or about eight and a quarter percent, can outperform the averages two years in a row. And over any 10 year period, 96% of professional money managers cannot outperform the averages on a risk adjusted basis. And again, let's look at those returns. Now you're beginning to see why we're able to select portfolios that return more than the S&P 500 and return more than Warren Buffett because again Warren Buffett used it as a filter and he handles too much money and it comes right out of his mouth when he says that and our portfolio up way above the S&P 500 almost three times and twice as high as Berkshire and remember that over the past 10 years or so Warren Buffett is saying he can no longer outperform the S&P 500. And right down here in the bottom, our model portfolio is buy and hold with changes, if any, taking place on the last trading day of the year. Most stocks are in the S&P 500 index, so it's not a trading portfolio unless you want to sell some cover calls on your stocks or, or any of those enhanced income methods. But for the most part, the returns that you're seeing here, buy once a year, hold on to it, rebalance once a year when you change stocks if the portfolio needs changing and you change about five or six stocks a year out of 30. Okay, let's look at some real stocks here. <laughs> well, let's look at MasterCard. MasterCard, you have your owner's equity, you have your net income. And remember, this is net income is the clean surplus earnings. And you select, you take away your dividends. And this is how you do it, folks. You take the owner's equity, let's go down here, of $23.40, your net income that year, which is your clean surplus earnings. 649 you pay out dividends of a dollar eight so you are going to subtract the dividends from your net income leaves you in this case with five dollars and 41 cents that's money that is put back into the company it's retained earnings put back into the company so we take this number add it to the 2340 and we start the next year with 2881 so you can see that the clean surplus return on equity in any year you take the net income divided by the owner's equity which is different than the traditional accounting owner's equity by a long shot and that gives you your clean surplus return on equity now since the net income takes away all non-recurring items and future liabilities so therefore we are comparing a company's core earnings in other words, if we're looking at McDonald's, what's it make selling its burgers and its fast food? We're not worried about if the owner has a Rolls Royce or a Bentley or something like that, or maybe all the family cars are written off under the umbrella of the corporation, or if they sell a piece of property. That That's a one-time thing in most companies, and it's not the core earnings. It's not their computer programs that they're developing or the fast foods they're selling. So we're trying to get down to the core operations of the company. That's what the net income does. 
Okay, now looking at MasterCard, we are looking at a clean surplus return on equity of about 20%. Now back here in 2020, remember that year? Yeah, that was the year of COVID. Everybody stopped buying stuff because they weren't allowed in most of the stores. And so it went down. But we're looking at excess of 20%. Remember what I said before? The average stock has a clean surplus ROE of 13%. So MasterCard, according to the clean surplus return on equity, is an above average stock. So let's see how it's done over the years. And when we look back at the past 10 years, black line is the S&P 500 with a clean surplus ROE of what? About 13%. MasterCard up here, returning about 500% over 10 years, where the S&P is returning about 160%. So yeah, MasterCard is way outperforming. And the numbers tell us that. Go back real quick. The numbers are telling us that MasterCard would outperform the S&P 500 or outperform the average stock. And there it is. Now, let's look at a summary of stocks that we've all heard about and how they performed. And so we're looking at, now I want, I want you to remember, this is 2012. All right, so we're going to go back and we're going to go forward. So don't let this year fool you. So we're looking at MasterCard, Visa, S&P 500, American Express, Capital One, Hartford Financial. We can see that Visa and MasterCard are have ROEs above the average stock. And don't forget, Visa just came public in 2008. So we're looking at a stock here that is relatively young when you consider MasterCard and these other stocks out here. So Visa had an ROE above the average stock and it was rising. You can see it started out at 9%, went up and now or not, not now, but 2012, it was 14%. It's a lot higher right now, folks. So we would expect MasterCard and Visa to outperform the averages, and we would expect the averages to outperform American Express. I know this is knocking the socks off, some of you. Outperform American Express, Capital One, and Hartford Financial. And let us look again. 2012, this is at the end of 2012 in November. Black line S&P 500. Guess what's outperforming the S&P 500? Visa in this orange line, MasterCard in this yellow line. And down here we have American Express. We have the blue line is Capital One. And Hartford is all the way down here at a negative 80%. Look at the difference, folks. Some of you may have Hartford Financial, you're down 80% over these past five years, while MasterCard is up, oh, about 190%. Visa is up 100%. The market itself is down about 10%. Hartford Financial is down 80%. And it's because we were able to look at the numbers. Now, let's go, well, let's catch up here, and let's see MasterCard. Gee, MasterCard is staying in the 20% level, isn't it? Look at Visa. Visa came up when we looked at it last time, what was it, 14%? Now it has risen, risen, risen 20%, and now the average stock is about 13, 13.5%, somewhere in there, depending how many stocks you measure. And American Express, Capital One, Hartford Financial, still underperforming, or have a lower ROE than the average stock. So the point that we're bringing out here is that the theory of clean surplus is, or the theory of investing, is that good stocks tend to remain good stocks and not so good stocks or below average stocks tend to remain below average stocks. And here we are. Let's bring this right up to date, folks. And black line's the S&P 500. And guess what? Blue line is Visa. <laughs> this mustard-colored line is MasterCard. So with the S&P up about, probably about 60% over the past 10 years now, this is, we have Visa up 400%. MasterCard up 500%, and gee, look down here. Hartford Financial is this yellow line down here. This kind of maroon colored line is American Express, and down here is Capital One Financial. So the three of these stocks are un still underperforming the S&P 500, way underperforming MasterCard and Visa. Good stocks tend to stay good stocks for a long time, and below average stocks tend to 
continue to be below average stocks. Now we're looking at some results for 2020 and these were the 30 stocks or almost 30 stocks I couldn't fit them all on here that were in our portfolio back in 2020 and you'll recognize some of these names because some of these names are still in our portfolio and black lines the S&P 500 and you can see that out of 30 stocks most of our stocks outperformed the S&P 500. So, and this was in 2020. And what's this big line up here? Yeah, that's NVIDIA. We've had NVIDIA in our portfolio for a long time, folks, and we are so happy we did. Okay, let's go to the sector spider ETFs. And we're looking at oil and gas, technology, utility, semiconductor, consumer discretionary, consumer staples, energy, finance, healthcare, industrials, and materials. And we took all the stocks. Now, this is research that we've done all these years, folks. We took all the stocks in each ETF and sorted from the highest return on equity, clean surplus return on equity, to the lowest clean surplus return on equity. Then we took the stocks with 20% or higher ROE because that 20% is the pretty much the threshold to get into our growth portfolio. So we use 20% a lot as a threshold. And then the stocks with the highest ROEs should outperform the stocks with the lowest ROE. So let's see one of many, many trials that we have done here. And okay, this looks complicated, but let's take it easy. This is the semiconductor ETF. And the one we're using is XSD. XSD, the semiconductor, spider semiconductor. So we took all, divided into thirds, the stocks with the ROEs above 20%, and here they all are. Now, this was five years ago. This was, well, 2020, three years ago, four years ago. And those stocks returned over the previous five years 419% very very nice then we took the second group of stocks of ROEs from 19% down to 9% so in other words we're dividing this ETF or these ETF stocks into thirds so the middle third averaged 112% over that five years so that's cumulative over the five years and the bottom third from 6% on down to a negative 5% return 42%. So I know you're dizzy looking at this. Let's break it down nice and simple. So with the semiconductor ETF over the past five years up here, look at, look at this five years up here, the semiconductor ETF, the XSD, returned 166%. However, the top third of these stocks as measured by the clean surplus ROE. The top third returned 419% over five years. The middle group, 112%, and the lowest group, 42%. So this is one of many, many trials that we have done with our ETFs and the actual portfolios that the top group almost always outperforms the second highest group and the third group almost always underperforms the other two groups. And the important thing is that the top group almost always outperforms the ETF itself. So when you have an ETF that's a hot ETF, you want to pick the five, six, seven, eight top stocks in that ETF, which we do, and we use our computer program to do that, and we will are pretty sure we will return more than the ETF itself. Now let's look at the 2020 results for we have seven stocks that were in our semiconductor ETF, black lines, the S&P 500, and all those seven stocks outperformed the S&P 500. When we looked at the technology ETF, well, we have a bunch of stocks that we had that are very, very good in the technology area. Black lines, the S&P 500, we had only one stock that did not outperform the S&P 500. And folks, this is Adobe, and right now, as I'm recording this, Adobe is a hot stock. So from 2020 on, Adobe really, really rocked the boat. 
And yeah, it's up. It's now up in, in, in the top group of stocks. But of course, we change some of these stocks as we go along, just again on a yearly basis. We very, very seldom change a stock during the middle of the year. And I should say, mostly always keep the stock. We did change one stock in the semiconductor group just because the ROE was getting too low. We changed it in the middle of the year. But for the most part, we leave them the same. Now, okay, so we have hedges, we have stocks that are doing very, very well, but the question is, how do you hedge? Because we all, everybody has clients that are getting on in age and they've accumulated some serious money and the key is they don't want to take risks anymore, but you as a money manager want to make them as much money as possible without taking on risk. And you also want to differentiate yourself from the investment advisor or money manager down the street. You have got to be able to differentiate yourself. So number one, to differentiate yourself, you want to be able to pick the best stocks in any ETF or or the S&P 500, which our computer does for you. And second, you want to be able to hedge some of those returns so that your clients that don't want to take risks, you can hedge the portfolios for them. And this is how we do it. So this little segment is called How to Hedge the Top Stocks in Your ETF, one, two, three, and you're done. And you can beat the market averages with less risk than the market itself. One, two, three, you're done. And then you can go to the beach along with your clients. Why not? <laughs> so let's look at the transport. And we're looking at the year 2020. So from 1231 of 19 to 1231 of 2020. And these were the five stocks that we had. And gee, we still have most of them, but not all of them. Anyway, the... Transport IYT, the transport index that we use, the IYT, because it pretty much tracks the S&P 500, but it's got some seriously good stocks in it. And you know the transport, where the transports go, the S&P will follow. So we're looking at, in the year 2020, the IYT returned 12.8%. Now, the top five stocks returned 40, a staggering 48%. So that was very, very good for these five stocks. But what we do to hedge is that we go long our top stocks and we go short the ETF itself. Now, you can do this in a regular portfolio. You, you can go short the index or any stock that you want to, but in IRA, it's different. But there are inverse ETFs out there that you could buy. So you could do some of this hedging in IRAs and other tax-exempt portfolios. So what we do is we go short the ETF or buy an inverse ETF for those IRAs, and we go long the stocks. So here was a very, very good year, and the long stocks returned 48% in one year. That's phenomenal. But we're short the ETF. So what did we get overall? We actually made 35% in that portfolio during 2020. That's an excellent return, and I'm showing you this because it is an excellent return. But what happens if we do more than one ETF, which we certainly recommend? There's five or six ETFs that we follow that are as good or better than the S&P 500, and therefore their top stocks will way outperform the S&P 500. And those are the ETFs we use. We don't use all the ETFs, just the good ones. So if we go short the ETF and long the best stocks, what do we come out with? We're in a long, short hedge position. Here we came out with 35%, but you don't get 35% every year, folks. So let's take that same transport ETF and use five years. Well, it's about four and three quarter years because when I'm recording this, 2023 was in the middle or toward the end of September. So we're taking five years in here. What did the S&P return? What did the top stocks in the IYT, the transport index return? And what did our long short position 
returns. So we're long and short every year. We buy the top five stocks, we go short the ETF, or buy an inverse ETF for those IRAs, and we go to the beach, or we go out and get other clients, or we watch television. Point is I'm bringing out is that you don't have to work very hard at this because you, first of all, you have to explain to your clients how well it's working. And when they see the market going down, they need some re reinsurance and you can go back to these numbers. So let's go to 2022 because that's the one we're interested in. Well, the S&P was down 19.5% and the top stocks in this transportation ETF was down 26%. Well, folks, Let's look at the, the averages down here. The top stocks in the ETF returned on average 34%, 34.7%. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. The S&P returned 13.7%. That's very, very good over five years. So averaging 13% is not bad when the average usually returns about 9.6% per year. I'm talking about the S&P 500. But what was the big drawdown? The big drawdown, again, 26% in the top stocks. How do you explain that to a client who has $3 million invested with you and he or she are losing $780,000, almost a third of their money? That hurts, especially if you're retired. So long and short, what did the long and short do during 2022? Well, it was down 3.2%. Folks, it has been averaging a 24%, 24.6% return over these four and three quarter years. But the key that we're looking at is the drawdown. We have a couple of ETFs that didn't lose money. They didn't make any money. They made about 1%, 1.5% in 2022. But you want to be able to calm down your clients. You want to be able to look at your mom and dad because they have their money with you, right? And say, hey, you almost didn't lose anything. What did the NASDAQ do in 2022? The NASDAQ and the QQQs were down 34%. So if you were in the portfolio, if you were in the technology or the semiconductor ETF, you have to explain to your clients you're down 30 some percent. But if you were long and short, you didn't lose any money in 2022, folks. And that's another whole video that we'll show you someday. So what we did is we said, what's the biggest drawdown here and if you had three million dollars now folks you can do this with three hundred thousand you could do it with three thousand because you don't have to buy a lot of these shares of stock you can buy one share of each of the stocks one share of the etf itself so you can do this with small portfolios that's the beauty of this you could hedge a small portfolio and that's what makes money managers so very, very happy because, hey, now you're differentiating yourself from the guy or the gal down the street because you're able to hedge these portfolios using this method. So what did everybody lose during 2022? Well, almost $600,000 in the S&P 500. And what does Warren Buffett say? He says, if you're going to invest for your family or for you as you're getting older, you might as well invest in the S&P 500 because he knows he cannot outperform the S&P 500 any longer. There's other reasons to be with Buffett, but outperforming the S&P 500 is no longer one of those reasons. So, so uh, you lost almost $600,000 with the S&P 500, and the top stocks, if you were in the top stocks without hedging, you would have lost 780000 That's a lot of money for a $3 million portfolio. And don't forget, if you're using 300000 or 3000 just subtract some zeros off of these. But in the long short portfolio, a $3 million portfolio would have lost $96,000, only 3.2%. Folks, that's very nice. What about the biggest gain? Well, yeah, there was one year in here, 2021, and that was a wild year, wasn't it, folks? When the S&P was up 27%, the top stocks were up 83%, long short up 57.7%. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So 2021 was kind of giving us a hint that 2022 wouldn't be too good. But if you're hedged, who cares? All right, so 
What did you return for five or four and three quarter years of one million seven hundred thousand? If you didn't hedge, you would have had two and a half million dollars, but you had to go through this seven hundred and eighty thousand dollar drawdown. So it's up to you. You can be in the top stocks for the younger people not might not want to hedge because there's some years where let's say the technology sector is up strong and the top five stocks, the top six stocks are also up strong. So if you're short the strong ETF, you might not make any money when everybody else is making 30%. That's why we use five or six ETFs because they don't all act the same in any one year. That's the beauty of all of this. So we looked at results in the year 2021 and this is what the S&P return the QQQs, the semiconductor, the XLK, which is the technology. Look what the top five stocks did in each of those. With the QQQs, the top five stocks returned 69% or what? We're looking at three times what the QQQs returned. The top five in the semiconductors returned almost twice as much as the semiconductor ETF did. And the technology returned almost well, more a little bit more than twice as much as the ETF itself. So what did our portfolio, our growth portfolio return during that time? It returned, well, the top 15 stocks, the top half returned 56% that year. So the key is to buy the stocks that are above average stocks and we use the clean surplus return on equity to do that and we showed you where the clean surplus return on equity is much much different than the traditional accounting return on equity and the traditional accounting return on equity is pretty useless as we showed you with the IBM example. So we want to show you the second edition of Buffett and Beyond published by Wiley Publishing. They liked the first book so much they said publish your second book or, or the second edition with us. So this is the book. If you want to read more about it, go get the book. Go to Amazon, get it. It's an easy read and there's some nice little short stories in there. And also, The Men Who Move Wall Street. This is a magazine that I was interviewed for and there's a nice story in there about us. There's the book on the cover. And if you want to get a copy of this, just email me at go to buffetandbeyond.com, get our email address off there, and we'll send you a nice PDF copy of The Men Who Move Wall Street. So folks, you've learned something today. You've learned a new method. There's a computer program that does all this for you. We send out daily letters to money managers. We send out three videos on the weekend that you can send to your clients. We have items for you, for your clients. We have the book you can give to your clients so they can be abreast of everything. The daily letter, you could have the daily letter sent to them. We can do that with no problem. But you might want to read the daily letter yourself because we put some stocks in there that shouldn't be in a portfolio and they might be in one of your client's portfolio. So if you're a portfolio manager in any way, a money manager, a registered investment advisor, an investment advisor who is not registered yet but needs an RIA, we can hook you up with them and so that you can go and keep getting your clients and have your model portfolio. So we give you the model portfolios, we give you the computer program, and just as long as you subscribe with us, we can give you everything you want. We can send everything to your clients or just send the three videos that we do on the weekends, which are very client friendly. So your clients are hearing from you all the time. So, okay, folks. Give us a call at buffettandbeyond.com. Go to our website, buffettandbeyond.com. There's a subscription page for you. And remember, if you want to live on this beach like Jimmy Buffett once did, you've got to learn how to invest even better than Warren Buffett does now. Okay, folks, stay safe. We hope to see you again.